The six parameters. The practice of the Mahayana of the Bodhisattva is mainly concerned with the six parameters. There are in fact ten parameters, but six of these are most commonly spoken of. So we will discuss the six parameters which constitute the Bodhisattva's practice. The Buddha said that when we do Dharma practice, it should be done in a genuine and heartfelt way. This means that when we practice Dharma, we must not just do it as an outer show or pretense or like a theatrical performance where actors dress up as kings and ministers, even though they are not really kings and ministers. We must practice Dharma wholeheartedly and very properly with our body, speech and mind. When we perform virtuous actions with our body, our mind should be there also working for Dharma. When we say things, our mind should mean it as well. Practicing the Dharma wholeheartedly is very important. If we do a prostration, for instance, our mind should also be filled with faith, devotion and confidence to make that prostration very meaningful. But if we just prostrate with the body and the mind and is not involved with it, then it is more like theatre, with us just going through the movements. But the power is not there. It is the same when we recite mantras. If we recite a mantra and at the same time our mind is visualizing, we are filled with certainty, confidence and faith. Then all the power of the mind will be there and it will be very good practice. But if we just recite the mantras and our mind is elsewhere, then it is just a show and the power is not there. It is not necessarily a bad thing to just do a prostration or a mantra mouthing the words. It just means the power is not there, just as it is not necessarily a bad thing that people pretend to be kings and ministers in the theatre. So if we really want to get everything possible out of practice, we need to do it very sincerely and wholeheartedly with our body, speech and mind. With this wholehearted approach, the Bodhisattva's practice is the practice of the six paramitas. The first is generosity, which means giving. There is giving to those who are worse off than oneself, such as the poor, needy and hungry. Then there is giving to those who are better off than oneself, which means offering them the three jewels. These are the two main areas of generosity of the Bodhisattva. When giving to those worse off, what is important is compassion. And when giving to those better off, what is important is faith, devotion and confidence. So when one gives to the poor, one relieves their poverty and hunger temporarily because of compassion. When one makes offerings to the three jewels, one makes an expression of devotion. If one never gives to those worse off, then compassion isn't there and is not complete. In the same way, if one doesn't make offerings to the three jewels, then one's faith, confidence and appreciation in the meaning of the three jewels isn't quite right either. So offerings are a very important sign of what is going on in terms of compassion and devotion. Beside cultivating love, compassion and devotion, the Bodhisattva also has to actually practice the paramita of generosity. The second paramita is moral or virtuous conduct. The very essence of virtuous conduct is that through love and compassion one does not directly harm other beings. If one had love and, compa and compassion and yet harmed other beings, then it is a sign that one's love and compassion isn't really there. So if one is loving and compassionate, then one must really never, ever harm other beings. This is the Bodhisattva's approach to love and compassion. 
Therefore, virtuous conduct is mainly concerned with the discipline of practicing right conduct with one's body and speech so that one doesn't, doesn't hurt others directly or indirectly. Generosity and virtuous conduct depend mainly on oneself. If one makes an effort to be loving and compassionate, it is relatively easy to develop generosity. Also, if one is loving and compassionate, it is relatively easy to maintain a high moral conduct because this depends mainly on working with oneself. The third parameter deals with something more difficult. It deals with how we react to situations arising from others, particularly what we do in the face of physical and verbal aggression from others. This is the parameter of forbearance, often called patience, which is remaining loving and compassionate in the face of aggression. The training of patience is the training of keeping one's love and compassion in the face of those difficulties which come from other people. So if our love and compassion is incredibly stable, when others hit us, no matter how much they hurt us physically, we never reply in a like manner. Our only response is one of love, compassion and understanding. In order to practice generosity, virtuous conduct and patience in the face of difficulties, one needs the fourth parameter of diligence to implement the first three parameters and make them increase and become even more powerful factors in our life. Diligence doesn't mean some terrible drudge or difficult effort. Rather, it is very joyful, meaningful and vital. If one really thinks something has benefit or one values it, and one will do it very joyfully and give it priority. Out of this, there is an automatic flow of diligence and industry. If one thinks something is not very important, one will, then one will think it is a drag and a bore, and one will do a little bit and then become lazy and stop. Later, one may try to do a little bit more and stop again through laziness. Diligence means to practice without falling under the influence of laziness and practicing because one realizes the tremendous value of that practice. Once one has gained an insight into its value, effortlessly there is joy and keenness to get on with it. Then automatically one puts lots and lots of effort into it to make it a very productive thing. One is diligent to increase the preceding parameters. The fifth parameter is mental stability. The Tibetan word for this parameter is gom, which is the word for to meditate. This is the active word and the word is derived from a root in Tibetan kom, which means to accustom oneself to something. So to meditate means to do what is necessary, to accustom oneself to something, it really means to train oneself in a certain area. What we are training is our mind. Even though we say, my mind, the mind which belongs to us is not under our control. Because we have not worked on it very much, our mind tends to be very distracted. It just switches from one thing to another all the time. For instance, we decide, I am not going to get angry anymore. Even though we decide that in one moment, we don't have control over our mind and so we fall under the influence of anger a little later. We may promise not to be subject to desires anymore and then we lose control and our mind is suddenly full of desires. So we think my mind is under my control, but when we look at it carefully, there is not that much control there. It is not like our hand. If we want the hand to go somewhere, then we can put it there. If we want it to come back, we can bring it back. But the mind is not nearly so tamed and doesn't listen so well. 
This is mainly because we haven't really done much work in bringing it under control. The word meditation has this implication of training or habituating the mind so that it does what we want. We habituate our mind by meditating again and again over the same things. This is the nature of meditation and the main point of the fifth parameter, mental stability. The sixth parameter is wisdom or prajna in Sanskrit. How much happiness we get out of worldly things depends on how much understanding and wisdom we have. So wisdom is the very root of happiness and joy and determines the value of all other things. In the ultimate sense, the benefit that we can get depends very much on our wisdom and understanding. Also, the ability to help others depends on the degree of our wisdom. Developing ourself also depends on the degree to which we have cultivated wisdom. For all these reasons, wisdom and understanding are the very root of happiness and out of them, joy emerges. How then does one cultivate this wisdom? For a Buddhist, it is cultivated by the three main approaches of studying 